from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the day Jesus was resurrected, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, happy Pentecost. I don't know if you noticed, but some red has been added to our Easter white. We are finally at the season of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is today. This is a big day. It's an important day. It's a day that we sometimes call the church's birthday because it's the day that we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit to God's people. And I think it's great that in our readings today, we've heard not one, not two, but three different stories about God's Spirit being poured out on God's people. Our first story happened in Numbers, when Moses was leading the Israelites through the desert. This is just after he had received the Law of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. They had just departed from Mount Sinai, and the Spirit is poured out on Moses and many elders, as well as two surprised people out in the camp, people who were not expected to have the Spirit poured out on them. And they all began prophesying, preaching, really, giving God's words to God's people. And then our second story is the most famous Pentecost story, of course, when the Holy Spirit comes down on the disciples at the first Christian Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down as wind and as fire upon the disciples, and they begin preaching in languages that are not their own. They are so inspired by this Spirit that the language barriers, the cultural divides between all of the many people visiting Jerusalem could not keep the message from being proclaimed even in their own language. And then we get our third story, our story from John of Jesus on Easter Sunday, appearing to the disciples and breathing the Holy Spirit onto them, or maybe better, into them, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. That story from John is the quietest of these three stories. It takes place behind closed doors to just a small group of people. There isn't a large crowd gathered as there is in the other two, and because of that, I think, it's often the most overlooked of the Pentecost stories or the giving of the Holy Spirit stories. But I think it's an important one, and so we're going to focus on that one today, on this Gospel story. So John picks up the story on Easter evening, and the disciples have locked themselves in a room for fear of the Jews, we are told. The Jewish leadership had, of course, just crucified Jesus. And the disciples had been hearing rumors of Jesus' resurrection, but they didn't know what to do with these rumors. They All they knew for sure was that Jesus' body was no longer in the tomb. And this worried them. It worried them because they thought the Jewish leadership, the powers that be at the time, might have other plans for Jesus' body, or perhaps other plans for them. They were afraid, and perhaps they were afraid of one particular Jew as well, Jesus. Because if Jesus is raised from the dead, and the last thing they had done was abandon him, or in Peter's case, deny him three times, a resurrection was not necessarily good news for them. They didn't know what Jesus' demeanor towards them might be if he came them as a resurrected Jesus. They weren't quite sure what to make of any of this. And suddenly, despite their preparations, despite their locked doors, Jesus appears in the midst of them, and he delivers the words that they long to hear. He says, peace be with you. 
with you. Jesus appears to them, and it appears that he has forgiven them their failings. He then shows them the marks in his hands and his side, proving to them that he's not just a ghost, an apparition, but the real Jesus, really resurrected, really present with them. And they rejoice. And then he reveals his purpose for coming to them. He says, peace be with you, and he breathes on them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now that last verse to us, I think, probably seems a little bit strange. Or at least it would seem strange if it was being spoken to us directly. We know about forgiving others. We know that forgiving others is important. We say it every week in the Lord's Prayer, of course. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But this verse, this command, this commission that Jesus is giving seems bigger than that somehow. He doesn't just say, forgive sins that are committed against you. He says, anyone's sins who you forgive, those sins are forgiven. He seems to be empowering his disciples to forgive sins that they really have no business forgiving. And it seems almost as if they're delivering God's forgiveness. It's a big claim. It's a big call. It's a big commission. I think it's a commission that we probably wouldn't be comfortable claiming for ourselves for the most part. It seems like too much power or it seems presumptuous to pronounce God's forgiveness. To somebody else. And yet Jesus pairs it with the giving of the Holy Spirit, which at Pentecost, 50 days later, falls out visibly and publicly upon all his church, and which we believe is given to each and every one of us in our baptisms. It's not an authority that we would be comfortable claiming for ourselves, but I also think it's not an authority the disciples were comfortable claiming for themselves as well. This story might, might sound familiar, this gospel passage, and it should, because it was our reading just a month and a half ago, but then it was part of a larger reading, a larger story, and we only heard a small part of that story. It's the story of Doubting Thomas. So the very next verse after our reading is this, but Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So if you remember the story of Doubting Thomas, Thomas is not there when Jesus appears. The disciples are excited about what has just happened, but Thomas cannot find it in himself to believe. He's too crushed, too disappointed to even hope that Jesus would be resurrected. He can't bring himself to believe it. And he says, unless I see and feel the marks and the wounds in his hands and in his side, I will never believe, says Thomas. And I think we often hear this story, we think of that story of Doubting Thomas as a story of failure of sorts, failure on the part of Thomas to believe. That's often the way we think of this story. I think that's the way I always heard this story, especially in Sunday school growing up. Thomas had a hard time believing. But I think the failure may not be on his part so much as it is on the part of the other disciples. The disciples, remember, are given the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit came a commission. They are to do what Jesus did, just as the Father sent Jesus into the world to proclaim God's love and forgiveness. Now the disciples are sent to bring God's love and forgiveness into the lives of those who most need it. And yet, if we continue reading the story about Thomas, eight days later, when Jesus appears a second time to the disciples, nothing has changed. Thomas still is unbelieving, as Jesus calls him. The disciples are still in that same room. The doors are still shut. It seems that nothing has changed. Jesus appeared to them, breathed on them the Holy Spirit, gave them this great commission, and nothing has changed. The very spirit that has been given to them, it seems, has not been used. It has not been shared. Not even Thomas has been restored. So after eight days, Jesus finally returns. 
And he offers his body to Thomas, and he offers his wounds to Thomas. Thomas feels the marks in his hand, the wound in his side, and he comes to believe. That spirit which had been given to the other disciples a week before is now given to Thomas as well. Thomas's doubt and unbelief is overcome by the presence of Jesus for him. It's almost as if the disciples didn't quite know what to do with the spirit they had been given, and so Jesus showed up and showed them what to do. And I think that much of the time, you're like these ten disciples, I know that I am. It's intimidating to us to carry that mission we have been given, to share that spirit which has been given to us with those around us. It's hard for us to proclaim God's love and forgiveness to those who are in most in need of it. Rather than sharing the gospel of Jesus' resurrection and forgiveness, we too often hide. Maybe we don't hide behind physical walls, but the walls of privacy or the walls of not wanting to offend anybody, not wanting to seem pushy. Perhaps we're afraid of acting too boldly. We're afraid of offending those who are in need of God's love and forgiveness by presuming to know what they need. Or perhaps we're more like Thomas, and we just have a hard time believing it ourselves. Probably each and every one of us has been in both of those camps at different times. I know I have. So Jesus returns to us as he returned to Thomas. He returns to us to once again make believers out of us unbelievers. He comes to once again breathe into us his Holy Spirit that we might share that with those around us. He comes to once again present us with his body so that we might be sent as he is sent. That we might carry his love and forgiveness into our daily lives and not just for our benefit but for the benefit of those around us. He comes to us in this bread and in this wine to release us from the sin that binds us so that we too might deliver the word of his love and forgiveness to those who are bound by sin. Now sin in John's gospel and in the Bible really, but especially when John talks about it in his gospel, is never just about things that we do. It's never just about immoral acts, bad actions that we commit, or things that we even fail to do. Sin is bigger than that in the Bible. It's a power. It's something that is over us, that oppresses us. It's a burden that we carry that weighs us down, that leads us to live in fear rather than in faith. It's a burden that weighs us down and binds us, keeping us from doing God's work or even hearing His words and believing them. And these burdens take many forms. It can be the fear of death. It can be hopelessness. It can be difficult relationships, financial insecurity. It can be declining health. It can be addictions. It can be feelings of worthlessness and depression. It can be sins committed by you or against you by somebody else. It can be doubts and unbelief. It can be guilt and shame. It can be many, many other things, and I'm sure you could fill in some blanks there. Sin is a big problem. It's all around us. It seems ever-present in our lives. So when Jesus tells his disciples that if they forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, it's not just saying it's all right that you did those bad things. It's better now. It is setting people free from their burdens. The very word we use that we say forgive in Greek could literally be translated as let go or release. That's the idea of forgiveness. It's untying those binds, untying the burdens which weigh us down. Earlier in the service, I gave you words of absolution, and I gave those words because I know that you are carrying burdens. Burdens from which you need to be free. We are all familiar with these burdens. We have all carried them far too often and for far too long. But when those burdens, the power of sin, weigh down on us, Jesus sent us his disciples, his spirit living in those disciples, to loosen those bonds and bring us relief and rest and comfort and peace by means of his love and his forgiveness for us. 
So therefore, since you are his disciples, since his spirit has been poured into your hearts, even though often you do not feel it or know it, I want you to think of those in your own lives who are struggling with burdens that are hard to bear. I'm sure you can think of some. People who are enduring hard times or experiencing grief. People who are now struggling to believe in the goodness of God. Perhaps people who have found themselves overwhelmed by the pressures of life or the burden of their sin and they are struggling to hold on to faith. Perhaps people who are caught up in the fears and the anxieties of this life so that they can no longer detect God's presence among them, even though He is present. These people whom you are thinking of, whoever they are, I believe that these are the ones to whom Jesus is sending you. These people are the ones for whom Jesus poured out His Holy Spirit on you in your baptism. And these are the people for whom Jesus is presenting Himself to you again his body and in his blood and the bread and the wine of communion. These are those whom Jesus is sending you to share in their struggles, to share with them God's love and forgiveness, especially when they cannot feel it for themselves. You see, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, and you have been commissioned to share that spirit with those around you. You are the most <coughs> disciples. You are uniquely situated, each and every one of you, to reach the people in your lives. You can reach some people in a way nobody else could ever do. You have been empowered to set people free from their burdens with God's forgiveness and love. And I know that very often you don't feel up to the task. And yet, that's all right because God's Spirit dwells in you. God's Spirit does do all the work that needs to be done. So, when you come forward and receive communion today, may you be so filled with Christ's ever-loving, ever-forgiving presence that His Spirit spills out of you, out of your life, into the lives of everyone you come in, come in contact with, with everyone you encounter. And I pray that that Spirit may bear each and every one of you.